Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to InCast episode three. Today's special guest is, as you probably already figured out, Abdulaziz Sharapov, one of the leading SAT teachers in Uzbekistan, helps so many people on a daily basis to get into the colleges of their dreams in America or even abroad. And uh, without further ado, uh, Abdulaziz, can you please introduce yourself? Thank you very much, Firzbik, for inviting me. For all those who are viewing this podcast, my name is Abdul Zisharapov, and at the moment, I primarily coach students for the SAT exam, and I also help students with the application process to American universities. For the past two years, I've been doing this job, and we've had some very great results so far. We've had students with 1,560, 1,580 scores, and most of our students do score 1,400. When it comes to university applications, we also have the most full scholarship students in Tashkent at the moment. We have students getting accepted to Ivy League universities like Princeton, Yale, Cornell, and such. So, Firuz Bik? Uh, wow, honestly, I don't even know what to say because that is just wonderful, especially hearing that from just like another person who's just trying to help others, right? Achieve their goals, get to America, to other places. Uh, that's honestly phenomenal, right? Uh, now, I actually had it had like a personal question addressed to you, right? So if you had to choose, right, between all the universities in America, which one would you choose to be the optimal one for Uzbek applicants, right? So again, you can take into consideration uh, scholarships, right? The placement, right? Um, you can also take into consideration uh, of how accessible it is for Uzbek students. Well, if we're talking about a single optimal university, you can't really choose one because students have different priorities. Some students are trying to get the best education possible, and for them, there would be a different option. Some students are just trying to study abroad for free. For them, it's going to be a different option. And some people just want to go to university so that they could travel or network with other foreign students. And for them, it's going to be a different option. So right now we've listed three categories and I could probably give you options for each. If you're really trying to get the best education possible, going to a university like Grinnell would be a great idea. Even though Grinnell is not ranked very high, in fact, you don't see them on any world rankings. They have some of the best education and they accept only the best students. If your goal is to just travel and network, it would be great for you to apply to one of the Florida universities, such as University of Florida, Florida International University, and University of South Florida. They all have very similar names. The uh, reason why I recommend... <laughs> The reason why I recommend those is because it's not expensive to study, but you also get a great environment, and there's also a lot of foreign students who study there. And if we're going to the third category of just being able to study for free, um, you just have to look for universities that provide full scholarships. In the United States, there's about 50 to 60 universities that provide full scholarship to international students. You just have to search find different options, see if they provide full scholarships, and then apply there. Wow, that's just great. So we've covered three categories, which was actually, to be honest, very insightful, right? And of course, taking into consideration uh, the tips that you provided yourself, um, I can state that, yes, very confidently, most students in Uzbekistan, that's what they're looking for, right? They're looking for these three main criteria, either the best education, uh, the accessibility of scholarships, or just traveling around and networking. Now, based on that question, I would like to actually give you another question, right? So if you had to choose between the Ivy League universities, which ones would you recommend for the students who are looking for scholarships to pick? Well, probably Yale would be the first one because mm -hmm. Yale already has a history of accepting a lot of Uzbek students. As of right now, I believe there are three or four Uzbek students studying at Yale's main campus. So for that reason, if you're an Uzbek student applying, you probably have a better chance there compared to other universities. Mm -hmm. It's clear that Yale already trusts Uzbek students. Um, another choice would be Cornell. Cornell is known to have the highest chance of acceptance regardless of whatever nationality that you're from. Uh, it's considered the easiest Ivy League. We don't, we, we're not trying to be rude or anything. Cornell is still a great university, part of the Ivy League. 
it's at the same level of Harvard. But if we're comparing it to other Ivy Leagues, then it definitely is considered the easiest to get accepted. So if you are planning to apply for the Ivy Leagues, those should be your two priorities. Now, if you're trying to go for the best Ivy League, of course, there's Harvard and there's also Princeton. So speaking on that topic of Yale and Cornell, why would you say that these two Ivy League universities in particular take Uzbek international scholarship students? Very great question. I believe the reason why is because they've already taken the risk before. They've already accepted a few Uzbek students. And those Uzbek students have proven themselves to be very academic, very focusing on their studies, and proven to have been beneficial to their class. So as a result, now those universities are more likely to trust Uzbek students in the future. Uh, there's a very similar situation amongst Kazakh students. The reason why MIT, Harvard um, accepts Kazakh people every single year is because a few Kazakh students at the very beginning of their acceptances have proven themselves to be very academic. Yeah. So that's a piece of advice to any of you guys who are applying to university or you've already been accepted. When you go to university, do not mess it up. Because if you mess it up, you're going to mess it up for your entire culture. Yeah, not only the culture, but the country and the nation at large, right? Uh, but I really liked that answer of yours because you're really showing that how these minority groups, right? We could be considered minority groups. If they excel academically at these Ivy League universities, then they simply open a gateway for their uh, future generations to also study there based on a scholarship or whatnot, right? Because again, in this day and age, not too many people can afford to pay fifty to sixty thousand dollars a year just to study abroad, right? So again, if anybody back home gets accepted to I don't know Harvard or MIT from Uzbekistan, be sure to show yourself because who knows you might be helping out your younger brother or maybe even your child, right? Now let's talk about out. Oh, I said child, right? Let's let's talk about that, right? So. There is some sort of a myth going on, right? Maybe myth, maybe something that has been stated previously about these Ivy League universities, especially Harvard in particular, having like a heritage scene, right? So they, uh, if your parents studied there, right, or if they sponsor that place heavily, maybe you'll be also granted a spot in, in that school. What do you think? Is that true or is that just something made up? Well, it's definitely speculative, which means there's no hard evidence, but there is a lot of truth to it. Mm -hmm. uh, and it makes sense. Um, a lot of these universities are often stereotypical. Like, think about it. They're only accepting Uzbek people because previous Uzbeks were great. They might not accept Uzbeks if other Uzbeks were bad. That sounds pretty racist. However, it makes sense. They're taking a risk. They're accepting these students and giving them scholarships. They have nothing to judge but past experience. Well, obviously there's the application, but apart from the application, they also take past experience into consideration. Such stereotypes could definitely be true. And it makes sense for many reasons. For example, if you come from a very hardworking family, a family that was academic enough to be accepted to Harvard in the past, most likely those same characteristics have been transferred over to their children and their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren. So they could expect great results from their grandkids. Yeah, from that family, the heritage. As a matter of fact, uh, I know myself that, especially in Harvard, there is somewhat of a heritage or lineage-based stereotype going on there. So sometimes, well, actually not sometimes, regularly, you're guaranteed a spot either in the bachelor's or master's to study at Harvard if either your parents or grandparents uh, were academically excelling students there, especially if you're from minority groups, because I know that lots of people from, like, if I'm not mistaken, it was either Malaysia, some Asian country, right? They had a two-generation scheme going on there. It, it, was, uh, it was really weird. But then again, yeah, how you present yourself, right, just generally and objectively is how a university, especially an Ivy League university, is going to perceive you, right? Now, based on that, let's move on to the next question addressed to you. So, again, um, speaking from your own past experience, what would you say are the most important factors while applying to these Ivy League universities? Okay. 
Well, first, let's start off by mentioning there's a lot of factors when it comes to applying. You'll have to show them your school grades. You'll have to show them SAT scores, your IELTS scores as well. You'll have to write them essays. You need to gather a portfolio, do some volunteering. There's a lot of things that you need to show the universities. But most of those things don't play a large role. Uh, the most significant factors are your school grades, which we call the GPA, your standardized test scores, such as SAT and IELTS, and also your essay writing. So let me explain why. The reason why GPA, your school grades, plays a big role is because they check your past four years, from 11th grade to 8th grade. That's four years of time. If they see that you maintained a great GPA for the past four years, it shows that you're able to dedicate yourself to something that's academic, compared to a student who does not have a high GPA. But this comes at a problem as well, because not every GPA, not every school is the same around the world. Um, Uzbek school might be easier or harder than a school in Germany. A school in Germany might be easier or harder than a school in France. So this is when standardized tests come into play. The reason why SAT plays such a big role is because if somebody has a great GPA, but they also have a high SAT score, the university will know exactly how smart this student is. A student with 1,420 in Uzbekistan is just as academic as a student in Germany with 1,420. So it allows the American um, admissions officers to understand you exactly to their own standard. And then the next component is essays, as I mentioned. The reason why essays are important is because it shows you as a person. Your GPA is just a number. Your SAT score is just a number. They want to understand you as a person, and the essay gives them an opportunity to do so. A lot of people focus on portfolio as well. They try to do a lot of volunteering activities. But honestly, those volunteering activities are not that important. They only become important once you start using them in your essay. Think of the volunteering, the portfolio, the activities as ingredients. Let's say you're baking a cake. Those ingredients are useless until you put them on the cake, which is write, use them inside your essay. So if you're able to have a really good GPA, really high SAT score, and you write pretty good essays, well, then you're set for most American universities. Yeah, that is quite an elaborate answer. I really appreciate that because that is very informative for the viewers back home, especially the part where you're talking about the essays and, uh, you know, how peculiar the process is because, uh, of course, your standardized tests such as your SATs and IELTS scores and your GPA, those are all just numbers, statistics, figures that show nothing to do with your own personality, right? And, of course, at the end of the day, universities, um, also take into consideration what kind of person you are. Uh, and I have lots of experience as well with the, writing these essays that as I've been doing that for as long as I can remember to be quite frank. And um, well, talking about essays actually, what do you think are some of the more prominent topics or some of the more common topics that people use, that people choose from the Common App, right? So as we know, there are different topics that you're given uh, for the cover letter, if I'm not mistaken, 650 word. What are they and uh, how would you describe them? Okay, so to clarify what Firuz is talking about, there's something called the college essay. This is one, uni this is one essay, a very big essay, that gets sent to every American university you apply for. And that's why it's very important. And you have 650 words to write the entire thing. They give you specifically six topics to choose from, but they also give you a seventh topic which allows you to talk about anything. I would recommend you to choose between those six topics. I can't really remember exactly each one word for word, but they ask you pretty vague questions. Like, what is an experience that led you to understand something about the world? Or they might ask you, what is a time when you felt very emotionally driven? Stuff like that. I would say choose the one that matches the topic you're going to talk about. So, for example, in my case, I wrote about my first day at Toshkent International School. 
the high school that I went to. And for me, it made sense to choose topic three, which is all about describe a day when you learn something new. So uh, in regards to choosing a topic, that would just be my advice. Depending on how you want to write the essay, choose the question that matches. Of course, wonderful answer. Um, now, you said that there is the seventh topic, right? And as we know, people back home, the viewers back home, they really enjoy sometimes getting creative and unique and whatnot. Therefore, what would your own opinion, uh, speaking from prior experience, of course, be about choosing your own topic, right? Because I, sh I know that like there are a few people, a few uh, hooligans out there who talk about their first uh, scoop of ice cream or their first uh, Mr. Beast chocolate, chocolate chip ice cream, I don't know. But, but just tell me what you think about that seventh prompt where you have uh, writer's will. I think you probably should not choose the seventh topic specifically because the admissions officers are trained to receive certain answers from the first second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. Uh, th they already know what type of answer to expect. So if you're able to give them an answer along those lines, they're able to better assess your essay. They're able to better understand it. But if you choose to answer your own question, the seventh question, at that point, it becomes harder for them to understand exactly how good or how bad your essay actually is. If you want to write something creative and you have something creative in mind, Many of our students have had in the past. If that's the case, then yes, you should choose the seventh topic. But otherwise, it should not be something that you start with. Of course, right? Uh, of course, there are the uh, handful of students that are being cherry-picked, right? Uh, the God's favorites who really get the seventh topic, the unique topic, right? And uh, they're able to actually get into these un uh, universities, right? Uh, I'm not, I remember the story about one person uh, writing their essay about, uh, what was it, ice cream and getting to Harvard? Oh. <laughs> yeah, God really does pick favorites. All right, that's fine, though. So let's move on to the next part. So, yeah, we discussed these uh, essays and the Common App at large. However, we didn't really discuss about how IELTS plays a role, right? Because why are we here today? We're, we're always studying IELTS, right? Internation, the place, uh, the home of the English language itself in Uzbekistan. So how would you say IELTS plays a role uh, for your university applications? Well, IELTS plays a very crucial role. Um, IELTS is considered to be a requirement. It's not like you could choose to send IELTS or you choose not to send it. You have to. And most universities will require IELTS 7. This means whether you have IELTS 7, 7.5, 8.5, it doesn't matter. You need to send your IELTS score. Does this mean somebody with 8.5 has a better chance than someone with 7? No. They both have similar chances because they both met the requirements. So does this mean it's better for someone to have IELTS 8.5 compared to just seven? No, not at all. Because both students have met the requirements. Both of them managed to achieve over seven. And so your goal should just be to get an IELTS seven. Come to Internation, learn the secrets behind the IELTS exam, get your seven, and go on with the rest of your application journey. Of course, wonderful answer. That really clears it up for many people because, you know, some people objectively have this, uh, like, thought in their head that, oh, my days, I need at least IELTS 8 to get into this great university somewhere abroad. Honestly, no. Like, if it doesn't matter if you have a 7 or 8.5, right? I've always known that this 8.5 is just a piece of paper. If I go abroad and it shows, hey, man, I have an IELTS 8.5, right? They're going to be like, Bro, what even is that? They're not even gonna know. So it's mainly university requirement. Um, however, it can play a role for Uzbek universities because you know some Uzbek universities have their English tests mainly based on your IELTS results. So the higher your IELTS result is, the more points you get if you want to become a scholarship student in, in Uzbekistan. Exactly. All right. But, but if we are talking about these Uzbek universities. Really, seven is enough. Yeah. Uh, as you may already know, Internation has thousands of students earning IELTS 7 every single year. So if you come here, that's the best chance for you to get IELTS 7. Of course. And then, I mean, wow, you can go to any Uzbek university. Is it Westminster, <laughs> right? Webster University, yes. any of them, right? Yes. Uh, so, however, you still need to get that 7. So don't get too, too ahead of yourself because uh, there always is that percentage that you might be able to slip up and maybe get 
6.5 or 5.5 because that happens sometimes. However, let's talk about like the psychology, the psychological part of of the uh, of your standardized tests, right? Like many people think that. If I, um, I don't know, if I'm not able to get that IELTS 7, then I'm not going to be able to go to any university. I'm not going to be able to do anything with my life. I'll be a garbage man, right? No, that's not true, right? You get two, three tries as much as your wallet can afford it. It's not a one-time thing in your, in your whole lifetime. So if it takes you maybe two or three tries to get that IELTS 7 or 7.5, then sure, go for it. We actually had a... Um, uh, well, a guest at our previous episode on the podcast who took IELTS twice, 8.5, and she's going for the third time because wow. she really wants that 9.0. <laughs> I mean, she wants to be the first girl in Uzbekistan to get IELTS 9, which is very respectable, right? Yeah. And can you also elaborate about the standardized tests and how your psychological view on it uh, plays a role? Well, of course, if you don't get the IELTS score that you want, it means that you're probably not able to get into universities. Let's say you have IELTS 6. Well, now your opportunities to apply to the United States might not be available. However, this should not destroy you. It doesn't mean it's the end of the world. Of course, you could take IELTS multiple times, so you just have to try again to get a higher score. Or you can try a third time to get an even higher score. Um, another thing about psychology behind IELTS is that you don't have to get a lot. We talked about this already, um, the difference between 8.5 and 7. I love giving this example to most students. When we're talking about these American professors or these American admissions officers at universities, they are all native speakers and they all hold a strong grasp of the English language. If you tell them that one student has IELTS 7 and one student has 8.5, they won't be able to tell the difference. It's like you as a human, you're looking at two dogs. I'm not calling anyone a dog here, but let's just use dogs as an example. Um, one dog is apparently two times stronger than the other dog. Are you able to tell the difference which one is which? Probably not. Let's use the same example for an ant. Let's say one ant is stronger than another ant. Are you going to be able to tell the difference? No. It's very similar for American native speakers they are not able to tell the difference between someone with 7 and 8.5. So they're not going to change their view on the person with 7. For them, they're both the same thing. Of course, that really does clear it up because, of course, there, yeah, there is no difference between 7 and 8.5. You meet the requirement, you pass. We don't then probably Westminster waits, <laughs> but still. Um, what I can say like completely and unequivocally that I concur with is the fact that e other factors determine your application or if you enroll or not into a university. Factors such as SAT and essays, which we have already covered. However, if we're, again, coming back to the psychological part, right? While you're taking your SAT, there's a lot of pressure on you, right? Especially, uh, well, I mean, nowadays it's gotten a little easier because now it's, uh, um, the SAT is taken by computer, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah. Uh, by comparison to the good old days where you had to fly out to Kazakhstan <laughs> and <laughs> take your SAT there, right? Now, what, what would you give, give some tips, right, about how to uh, keep composure during the SAT test itself? First thing is that you should have the right amount of preparation. Most cases where students are nervous is because they know that they didn't study enough. Confidence arises once you know you've studied three to four hours every single day before the test. That's when you go into the test saying, yeah, I've studied everything I know. It's the first thing. Second thing is to understand that everybody in the room is not a genius. In fact, most of the students in that room are not geniuses. Most of the kids there have not studied in the correct manner. And so you should not be intimidated by the people sitting around you. Uh, in my own case, I've never understood when students are nervous. It's just something about me. Um, whenever I take a test, I always look at the people around me and I think, huh, look at all these losers. Look at these chumps. <laughs> exactly. And that's just the mentality that I have inside. Exactly. Now, it might seem rude. Some people might say, Abdul Aziz, you can't say everybody's a loser. 
it benefits me to have that mentality. It allows me to keep my composure and make sure that I perform well during the test. And it's shown itself in many cases. I do better during the test itself compared to my practice because I have all these people around me because I need to prove myself. Of course, right? A very competitive mindset can really, uh, you know, despair you from the crowd, right? Because you're looking at them and if you're thinking, oh my days, all of them, probably SAT 1700 bare minimum on a bad day, what will I do, right? That's a very bad mentality. And I can really uh, relate to you because whenever I'm taking a test, be it an Olympiad championship, IELTS, SAT, I just look around, I'm like, what are these? Ants, right? <laughs> so uh, if you really have a competitive mindset, then this can really, really go a long way. Even if you haven't studied as much as you wanted to, if you keep your composure and know that you will perform well, then you will com uh, you will perform well. That's uh, that's like a pro tip, I guess, right? From uh, people who have spent most of their lives taking tests, various be the academic, written, whatnot. So yeah, this is what we can mainly say. Uh, I guess we've covered most of the topics that we had to, right, Abdelaziz? Yeah, I believe we've answered most of our questions so far. Is there anything else you'd like to say? Well, I guess, lastly, I, I would just like to state for the viewers back home that it's the most important thing, not considering your, your written tests, not considering your IELTS, SAT, and whatnot, the most important thing for yourself is to set your own goals, future aspirations to stone. If you can see crystal clear exactly what you want to be doing in five to 10 years from now, and well, of course, if your heart's in it, then you will most definitely be able to succeed. Unconditionally of the academic adversities that you might face throughout the very tough journey, you will still get there. What about you, Abdelaziz? Would you like to say a few last concluding words? Yeah. You know exactly what you want in life. And while other people might tell you, you should probably do that, you should probably do this, follow what makes you feel comfortable. And remember to always have the right guidance as well. You might want to go to the United States, but you might not know how to. So it's always important to listen to people who have experience applying abroad, who have also gotten accepted with full scholarship before. Take their advice. Don't be arrogant like some people. And after taking their advice, make sure that you follow it. One of the biggest problems that a lot of students have is that they're not consistent with their practice. They're not consistent with their goals. Make sure that you're working towards your goals every single day because each small effort that you make compounds into something greater. And that greater thing it becomes is you. You become a greater person. Very well said, Olaziz. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I truly hope that this episode was interesting for you. It was a little longer than usual. However, we really st stated some very crucial parts, tidbits of information that you might need for your future. Thank you very much and hope to see you on the next episode.